Now, um, we have a very special guest with us. I've already named some guests with you, but we have the secretary of our district, um, Ed Nelson, and uh, his wife, lovely wife, Gail. Um, they're also uncle and aunt, um, so uh, they, um, they are very special to Christy and I, but I want you to listen very closely as, um, as Pastor Ed speaks, that's weird saying Pastor Ed, um, as, as Pastor Ed speaks to you. Yesterday, I was with him in a meeting, and people kept saying Ed, and I'd look real quick, and it was just constant. But um, I was in a meeting with him yesterday, I'm going to tell you something about when Ed speaks. I felt like I was in a college class yesterday. Everything that he dropped on us, and, and the, just, he brings the Word of God alive. And um, he, uh, he is an incredible teacher, but he's also, he has been in our national office over missions he has been on the mission field. Um, he has been all over the world. He has helped translate Bibles into different languages that I can't even tell you what the language is because I can't pronounce the word. Um, he has done some incredible things for the kingdom of God. So I'm just going to ask you for the next couple of moments, will you just give him your best attention and just listen? Um, I promise he will be a blessing. Ed, if you'd come, please. Thank you, Pastor Ed. <laughs> Thank you, nephew. <laughs> it's a pleasure, honor for us, for Gail and I, to be with you this evening and to be part of this historic occasion tonight to see the gospel go places it's never gone before. There are still people around the world but have never heard the name, not once, the name Jesus or whatever language of the world you may translate it into. There are still 98% of the Muslim world that has never heard the name of Jesus, not in the terms of an adequate witness of the good news of salvation. Gail and I dedicated our lives many years ago to taking the gospel to the furthest, to the most remote places on the face of the earth. Matter of fact, in the years I served in Springfield, Missouri as one of the directors of our foreign, foreign missions enterprise to the far corners of the world, we made a deli deliberate effort to move from the 98 countries we were in to what now, Ken, uh, almost 200 countries of the world now. And we made a deliberate effort to target the unreached people groups. We call them UPGs, the unreached people groups of the world. Gail and I spent our years there helping put behind the strategies that would reach these places where the gospel had never gone. And then when we left there, we went and, with our heart's burden for the world. We went to the West Coast where we pastored a great congregation in order to be near the Pacific Rim, that, that earthquake rim out there, from the Philippines to Indonesia, all the way around up into Japan, to Anchorage, Alaska, to be near that part of the world where the unreached people groups seem to be. And so we spent a lot of our time uh, uh, pastoring, but also the Lord was preparing us for another venture. And that was to take the gospel to unreached people groups where the Assemblies of God, who is the most aggressive mission agency on the face of the earth. There's nothing comparable to it. It's the, most, it's the grandest missionary enterprise in the history of the world. There's nothing comparable to what the Assemblies of God does in the world. But there were still places in the world where the Assemblies of God could not go due to restricted access by governments. And so we committed ourselves to find a way to take the gospel to the restricted access countries of the world. And we knew we could not use Americans. We had to discover apostles that lived near those people that had heard the name of, of the Messiah and prepare those people to take the gospel further than the Assemblies of God could take it as far as American missionaries goes. 
And we saw in those years we led that ministry, we saw it start where there was no gospel message. And in the years we did it, we saw 20 million people hear the name of Jesus the first time in their lives. It's amazing. It's amazing. We're still assemblies of God, and we, we support world missions. But, but you have to find creative ways to go where no one has ever gone in the name of Jesus before. And we dedicated our lives to that cause. And I saw on here that I was a former missionary. And I looked at that and I said, I've never been called that. I guess it's because I've been associated with a district office for some years. But I don't even think that way. It's honorary. It's not honorary. I don't want to be former. I'm not former. That's like being deceased. Once you're a missionary, you are a missionary. You breathe it, you eat it, you sleep it, you dream it, you envision it. It's all about who you are. It never stops. It's the very DNA of the Holy Spirit within us. I'm supposed to speak to you from the Word of God. And I desire to do so. And I want to give you a scripture. Here's some notes. You want to use them? Okay. I'll take them up here then. They won't help me much. But I do want to use a scripture here. Found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. You don't need your Bible. It's going to be real easy. If you want to hear it in the Greek, I can give it to you in the Greek. That's a foreign language to us, isn't it? Theogar is main synergo. Oh, synergo. Synergo. You know what I'm talking about now? What's the English word that comes to your mind when you hear the word synergo? Synergo. Come on, help me here. Ken. Sin, S Y N E R G O. What's the word that you can think of that comes from that? Synergy. Thank you, Bill. He is the guy that's going to get the votes tonight for the best table here. He just helped me in a way that nobody was helping me. So learn another language. But here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You heard the word synergy, didn't you? Here's what it says, and depending on your version of the Bible. For we are laborers together with God. Another translation says, we are God's co-workers. I like that. Another one says, for we are God's fellow workers. I like this one. For we are synergo. We are the energy to gather in partnership with God to do great and mighty exploits in his name. That's who we are. I'm a Pentecostal. I was baptized in the Spirit when I was 17 years old, and a missions convention started burning in my heart, and it's never gone out. I cannot be called former. I'm current. Because inside of me is a dynamo of the Holy Spirit that compels to take the gospel to the least and the furthest and the remotest and the ones that have never heard the name of Jesus. I can't put that inside you, and you cannot put that inside me. But we together can help each other where we have that sense of urgency and begin to bring substantial change to the face of the earth. Did you know that in the, in the 100 and now, what, 10 years of the Assemblies of God, 105 years of the Assemblies of God, that 1% of the world's population are assemblies of God. Almost 1%. You say, well, what about the 99? That's what I'm asking you about. It never expires. The good news never expires. And whatever you be accolades you put on yourself, it is not enough for what the possibilities are for the kingdom of God. 
I want to share with you something. I, my, my background is Hebraic. I speak Hebrew. And I read the Bible in Hebrew. I don't pray Hebrew in front of my wife. She won't let me. But I would. I love to pray. And that's, that's not speaking in tongues either. But I love it. But if I took you to the Hebrew worldview of the Bible on this page, it may astonish you. For example, God's Word says you and I work in partnership with God. And I'm going to ask you a question. Does God need a partner? Yes, He does. That's what's going to astonish you. God works with partners. That's how he does his mission. That's how he accomplishes his person, his purpose on earth. Did you know no miracle has ever happened, none ever happened, where the, where the, the initiative did not begin with the obedience of faith on the part of a person? God does not act in solo. He says, I am a partner in God. I partner up. I yoke up with you. And you yoke up with me. And together you shall do great and mighty things in my name. Here's, let me give you an example. So that's why I brought the notes up here. Because I got it translated from the Hebrew. So I want to give it to you a little bit in English. Not Hebrew, English, but a translation. I just, I did for you. And this is in the, was the Red Sea parted by God or by Moses? Who wants to answer that one for me? Who parted the Red Sea? Who? Both partnership, synergy. But here's what it says. And, and this is where God, Moses talks about God's greatness, and then God corrects Moses about it. Here's what he says. They're standing at the Red Sea. The Pharaoh's army is encroaching them and would have destroyed them or captured them, enslaved them, and taken them back to Pithom and Ramses, if they could. But there's a massive cloud of God's presence in between the army of Pharaoh and the children of Israel. And that's where the presence of God is. So Moses, recognizing the presence of God is between them and the army, makes this incredible statement. Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of God, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today you will never see them again. Now, what is Moses thinking? He's not thinking about the Red Sea. He's thinking that God's going to turn from that cloud onto the army in the plains of Egypt and that encampment and destroy them. Moses is saying, stand still, do nothing, just watch God fight the battle for you. There is no synergy here. And so the, the next thing is Yahweh punches Moses and says, Moses, Moses, you're wrong. Why are you crying out for me to do this? That's not how I work. Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. Where do they go forward? They're already at the sea. Now, where do they go forward? They march into the sea. They've got to do something called the obedience of faith. Without the obedience of faith, it's not going to happen. Now, in the Hebrew uh, world, you'll have many commentaries on that that says exactly what I just told you. They marched up to their necks in the sea before the waters began to part. They're about to drown. And then God says, as for you, Moses, lift up your staff, the one you had at the burning bush, the one you had before Pharaoh, 
and stretch out your hand over the sea. And here's the command of God. And you divide it. It does not say I'll divide it. It says you divide it. What would that do to you if God said, I want you to go out and I want you to stop the interstate on both sides. Hold your hands up. Stop the cars coming. You say, I'll get run over. I can't do that, God. I'm not telling you to do that either. Because God doesn't need you to do that. But there was a need for the salvation of a nation, and the only way out for that nation was to go through the water. And God says, Moses, you divide it. That's my point I'm making with you. No miracle ever happens without the participation of the people of God in the miracle. Jesus said it this way, I, if you will proclaim the word, I will match it with signs following, not preceding it. Following it. The obedience of faith is required to move the mountain. The obedience of faith is required on your part to divide the sea. The obedience on your part is to do the faith promise. To do something that will make a difference in people's lives. So, am I too loud? It's okay. okay. Gail says I yell sometimes. So, I don't yell. I get excited. Okay. I'll illustrate it real quick. Naaman had to go dip seven times, didn't he, in the, in the river? Why? Because God needed that Syrian general to participate in the obedience of faith before the miracle would happen, that before he would be healed of leprosy. When Jesus said, there's 5,000 people here not fed. I want you disciples to feed them. But, but Jesus, we can't feed them. He said, find somebody who's got some food and see what happens. So they went and found a boy, and he had five loaves and two fish. It had to have a human initiative called the obedience of faith in order for it to work. And then God said, that's enough. Five loaves and two fish, more than enough to feed 5,000 people. It's amazing, isn't it? You ever been on the road to Jericho and coming out of Jericho to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem? Ever been there? Ever been to Israel and saw that road to Jericho? How wide is it? Six feet, most, at times, sometimes four. So Jesus is on the road to Jericho. There's a man named Blind, Bar Bartimaeus. He's blind. He's calling out to, to the Messiah saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus is two steps away from him. At the furthest, what does Jesus say? He says, he turns to his disciples and says, you go and bring him to me. Two feet, two yards. No, it has to take the disciples. Moving their feet over to where that blind man is, lifting him up and walking back to Jesus for the miracle to take place. They brought the sick to him, the Bible says, to be healed. So what does that do for us? In Sri Lanka, I was preaching a meeting on that, uh, that teardrop island. We're on the English, the UK table, and we had some tea over here tonight. And Sri Lanka is a place where they grow a lot of, in India, tea for the UK. And in Sri Lanka, I was there, it's primarily a Buddhist country. And there was a pastor on the outskirts of this capital city of Colombo uh, who's, who was holding a, a meeting, and I was a speaker on a Wednesday evening. Now, here's how you get in this meeting. It's at the YMCA. The YMCA is, is a, a band shelter in the back of an, a large open field. And I was to speak from the band shelter out across that open field. And here's how you go to it. You cannot go to that meeting. It's called Miracle Night unless you bring a Buddhist. The Buddhist is your ticket. If you come and you don't bring a Buddhist with you, you're not admitted in because it's limited space but only about 800 people. And so it's packed. 
Half of them are Buddhist, half of them are believers that brought them. And I'm speaking, and I, I'm not even speaking on miracles. But I know it's miracle night. I know the anticipation is that miracle, but I believe God gave me a message of simplicity to tell them about the love of God, how God loves them, and how he revealed his love to them through the Messiah, Jesus. And as I'm speaking about two-thirds way through that message, there was an uproar about two-thirds deep into the night, into the dark, where all those people were seated on the open field. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't stop the pace of preaching. I went on. Another uproar. And then another one. And I didn't know what was going on. But at the end, I gave the message to bring people to the Messiah, to faith. And they brought a 12-year-old girl from, forward. She was the first one. She was Buddhist, not a believer. She had been blind since birth. And at 12 years of age, in that meeting, she received her sight. God opened her eyes for the first time. It was an amazing story. It was one of several that night. It happened to people who were not believers in God. They're Buddhist. So it's not about their faith. It's about the faith of the believer that took the initiative to bring them. That made the difference. It wasn't my preaching. I wasn't preaching on receiving miracles. I was preaching on receiving Jesus, the one who does them. You see, there's amazing things happen when there's synergy. One can put a thousand to flight, the Bible says, but two, ten thousand. See the synergy in that? And when you do a faith promise card, you are engaging synergy with a whole bunch of people. You are doing something that cannot be imitated except through another person doing something by faith. Because when you're putting a number down on your card, you are saying, I'm trusting God for this amount. It's not a pledge. It's simply a desire. And I promise to make this happen if you provide for me. I need a miracle, Father, in order to make this promise happen. I cannot do it on my own. And you stretch yourself sometimes. You don't have to stretch yourself. But if you do stretch yourself, you're not obligated. You're not done. You're not billed. You don't get a letter saying you're not, you didn't pay this month. That's not important. What is important for is you to act in the obedience of faith to step into the deep water and believe God will part the Red Sea. It's important for you to step into the Jordan River and believe that God will bring healing to the leprosy uh, of your hands. It's important that you see that if you bring five fishes and two loaves, it's more than enough to feed 5,000. There is a divine synergy, a partnership in working with God that will turn things around in the world. Now, I, I wish I could talk to you more, but I don't need to. You can tell it's just in me, right? I want it in you. Pastor wants it in you. And the thing is, you want it in you too. Every one of us here wants to be like that. And it's, it's the harnessing up with God as a partner. And it's always our initiative that makes the difference. So I'm going to ask you to, when, I'm, I'm like, I'm pastor now. That's what I would do if I was pastor. I'm going to ask you to do something special tonight. I'm, that's going to happen tomorrow. Some tonight, some tomorrow. But I'm just telling you, it's an opportunity for you to partnership, to hook up, to link up, to put your arms together metaphorically with God, to believe God that you will do might, mighty, great exploits in his name, that things will take place in the lives of other people. That's what, that's what it's all about. Pastor Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Father, thank you for this dear pastor who has a vision and a sense of mission that will not go away. He has linked up with you. Christy has.
the team has. This congregation is linking up together to bring about a great miracle of salvation for the nations of the earth from here, from Fort Mill, in Jesus' name, amen.